According to Dante, the deepest circle of hell is reserved for treachery. It's where Satan is, and in his mouth, in the constant gnashing of the betrayer's teeth, is three people. One of those three is Judas. Tell me about this Judas, I hear you say. Well, in the 1990s, Sega was positioned to become a dominant force in the video game industry. The company had already made significant inroads with its Sega Genesis console thanks to Tom Kalinske, the president of Sega of America, who had before re-established the popularity of Barbie for Mattel, and at one point put Sega ahead of Nintendo in market share in the US. Kalinske was a man to be reckoned with, as he had made Sega a popular alternative to Nintendo. However, Sega of Japan could not get out of the way of its own success, and internal strife between Sega of Japan and Sega of America significantly hampered Sega's potential for success. This is the story of betrayal between Sega of Japan and Sega of America's leader, Tom Kalansky. And sort of like the opening of Disney's Hunchback of Notre Dame, it makes you wonder who is the monster and who is the man. And personally, regardless of the betrayal, I don't blame Kalinsky for what he did. Let's see what you think. Let's talk about the leadership of Tom Kalinsky. Again, Tom Kalinsky was a seasoned executive with a proven track record, having revitalized the struggling Mattel with successful product lines like Barbie and Hot Wheels. When he joined Sega of America in 1990, he brought a fresh and aggressive marketing strategy that starkly contrasted with the more conservative approach of Sega of Japan. Kalinsky's strategy involved several key initiatives that contributed to the success of the Genesis in North America. Kalinsky recognized the importance of marketing to Sega's targeted demographic, teenagers and young adults. Nintendo was taking care of the babies, and Kalinsky recognized the importance of the aging demographic. Teenagers had attitudes and were budding into their rebellion. So he capitalized on that. He spearheaded bold advertising campaigns such as Genesis Does What Nintendo Don't, which directly challenged Sega's biggest competitor, Nintendo. This confrontational style resonated with the audience and their teenage angst or unrest, whatever you want to call it. But kids aren't all right. As it is with the United States, apparently being a rule follower is just not cool. Gonna show you how we feel. We're gonna dump this tea. Secondly, in this aggressive marketing, Kalinsky suggested offering Sonic the Hedgehog in a bundle with Genesis. Sega of Japan just thought this was dumb. They took so much time refining the concept of Sonic to make it edgy for the American audience, to make Sonic fresh and cool and avant-garde. Despite this already rustling Sega of Japan's feathers as they were a bit more conservative than this, they listened, and then Kalinsky dropped a bomb on them and told them that they needed to bundle it for free with the Sega Genesis. Sega of Japan, of course, was shook, but trusting that Kalinsky knew what he was talking about, they relented and agreed. Kalinsky was right. Sonic quickly became an iconic character and gave Sega a mascot to rival Mario, further boosting the appeal of the Genesis and cranking up the sales of the Genesis console quickly. Thirdly here, Kalinsky pushed for more localized content. Kalinsky emphasized the need for content that appealed to specifically American audiences. This led to the development and promotion of sports games and other games that were particularly popular in the United States. It sounds super simple today, but simply figuring out what audiences want and delivering on that was almost revolutionary for the time regarding video games. And Nintendo seems to be struggling with that still somewhat. Ooh, kinda bad. But whatever. We digress. Maybe Nintendo's erring on the side of they don't know what they want until we tell them. And I guess that's fair. Despite all of the awesome things that Tom Kalinske was putting into place, controversy or not, there were several points of contention as well. Again, despite his proved success, Sega of Japan had some major problems with him. Kalinsky's decision to bundle Sonic the Hedgehog with the Genesis and sell it at a lower price point was initially opposed by Sega of Japan. The Japanese executives were concerned about the potential loss of revenue from game sales, understandably since they had put so much time and money into Sonic. However, Kalinsky's approach proved effective in increasing console sales, demonstrating a fundamental difference in market understanding between Sega of Japan and Sega of America. Kalinsky really pushed for software development as well. Kalinsky advocated for more autonomy or just being able to do its own stuff for Sega of America and software development 
to better cater to the taste of the Western market. Sega of Japan, however, insisted on maintaining strict control over the game development process. And the, this caused a problem. The friction between Kalinske and Sega of Japan often resulted in delayed releases and missed opportunities to capitalize on trends in the American market. All because Sega of Japan wanted to control the, the way the software was made, what software was made. One of the most significant clashes occurred over the introduction of new hardware. Sega of Japan focused on the Sega Saturn, a more advanced but also more expensive console, while Kalinske saw potential in the 32X, an add-on for the Genesis that could extend its lifespan and offer a more affordable upgrade path for consumers. Sega of Japan's insistence on prioritizing the Saturn led to a fragmented market strategy that ultimately flopped. This just confused consumers and undermined the potential success of both systems in both markets. And a final point of contention here, let's listen to this. Kalinske's marketing strategies often clashed with the more conservative approach preferred by Sega of Japan. The Japanese executives were uncomfortable with the aggressive in-your-face style of advertising that Kalinske believed was essential for capturing the American market. There was a lot of dissonance between these companies, right? So where did the betrayal come in? Well, we're not there yet. We're getting there. But I want to point out a couple of other things, issues that were happening between Sega of Japan and Tom Kalinske. These conflicting priorities and strategies between the two branches led to a lack of coherence in Sega's market approach. Kind of like mom and dad can't agree, so it's a problem. The household's a little broken. Consumers received mixed messages, and the company's efforts were often just disjointed. This was particularly evident in the handling of the 32X and the Sega Saturn, where the simultaneous promotion of both systems diluted their impact and confused the market. I want something from Sega, but do I want a 32X or do I want a Sega Saturn? It sounds like they're trying to sell me both of them. The power struggle over control and decision making slowed down innovation and responsiveness as well. For instance, while Sega of Japan was focused on the technically superior but complex and costly Saturn, the emerging PlayStation from Sony capitalized on the opportunity to capture the market with a more straightforward and consumer-friendly approach. Sega's delayed and fragmented response allowed Sony to gain a foothold that it might otherwise have struggled to achieve. They kind of caught Sega with its pants down. Let me stop! Let me stop! Let me stop! Let me stop! The reluctance of Sega of Japan to fully embrace Kalinske's insights into the American market resulted in missed opportunities. And let me point out that Sega of Japan hired Kalinske, but then didn't want to listen to his suggestions, particularly about the Western market. As an example, the conservative approach to software development and marketing led to a lack of compelling titles and promotions that could have strengthened Sega's position in the critical North American market. Kalinske wanted to spend some money, he wanted to break some eggs, and they had worked with Sonic before. Since then, after Sonic's success, for some reason, maybe they were jealous. They just they didn't want to listen to what Tom Kalinske had to say. So this this doesn't really make Kalinske sound like the great betrayer Judas or anything, right? It's it's uh, this is more like accolades for Kalinske. Understandably so, because Kalinske did a lot of amazing things for Sega. Trust me. There's great interviews with Kalinske. There's wonderful information out there. So where's the betrayer? What happened? With all this context and history for Kalinske at Sega, what's the betrayal, right? The Saturn was sort of dead on arrival in its first iteration. Sega had been planning for its new system and didn't anticipate Sony to announce the beast that it did. The Sony PlayStation's chipset and capability outclassed the Sega Saturn, and so the heads at Sega of Japan ordered that the Sega Saturn be refined to be competitive. That's a good decision. After all, the system hadn't seen store shelves yet, and it was already old hardware by the PlayStation standards. To deal with Sony's beefy single chip that it was using in the PlayStation, Sega more or less decided to double up the chips that they currently had. Rather than go with a one chip superior solution, they took two of the other chips and worked them together to make the system more powerful. What's better than one? Too, right, but it didn't quite work out that way. They had to do this due to time and cost constraints. It's sort of like Nintendo's concept of taking yesterday's tech and making it work. But Sega didn't quite make it work as well as they had hoped they could. So how does this fit into Kalinske's betrayal? Well, Kalinske did contact a friend at Silicon Graphics Inc. and asked for them to start considering a chip for Sega. SGI had some major breakthroughs around this time and Kalinske knew that this promise tech would be good for Sega. Kalinske shared this idea with Sega of Japan 
and the tech folks flew out to SGI to check out the chip. The crew there, from what I understand, kind of just ruthlessly attacked this chip and criticized it. They said that it used too much power, that it was too large, and it would have to be refined. So Kalinsky's buddy, Jim Clark, put the folks at SGI back to work on reworking the chip for Sega naturally. Since they had a customer already, it made sense to put the resources to work on this chip. Once they had reworked it, the folks from Sega of Japan, including Nakayama himself, the president of Sega of Japan, came back to check out the chip. What it boiled down to is that Nakayama said that the chip simply wasn't good enough. What do you want? What do you want? It's not that simple. What it's do you want? The weird thing is that it was definitely good enough. Why did Sega of Japan want so desperately for Kalinsky to have this failure? It's a good question really and one that has been explored greatly throughout video game history. But in the end, it was Nakayama's call, not Kalinsky's on this chip. Kalinsky was just trying to help his company succeed. Where's the issue? Jim Clark contacted Kalinsky later and asked him what he was supposed to do now after all. They had helped tailor this chip to the needs of Sega, and SGI had poured resources into this to make it happen. I got no place else to go. Now they had no customer, but a nice chip. And this is where it went down. This is where the betrayal happened. Kalinsky, I'd imagine out of frustration for many things, frustration for being cut off from success, and control over and over from Sega of Japan. Frustration for trying to drag a company to success that worked so diligently to fight against it. Frustration of not being recognized for his successes and instead being blamed for things that were beyond his control. Just, there, there's a lot. A lot of frustration there, I'd imagine. And everyone, everyone has a breaking point. Kalinsky told Jim Clark, sell it to another video game company. One account, and I'm paraphrasing here, had Kalinsky saying, sell it to that little company up in Washington. That's Nintendo, by the way. And that's exactly what Jim Clark did. As the story goes, Jim Clark contacted Nintendo about this chip. Nintendo bought it, and it became the Nintendo 64. So Kalinsky, fed up with his company, in an attempt to help them at first, decided to betray them. But again, I don't blame him. So I know that this video suggests that Kalinsky is just the absolute worst, but really, he was probably the best thing to ever happen to Sega as a company. Thank you, Tom Kalinsky. The discord between Sega of America and Sega of Japan during the 1990s serves as a cautionary tale about the importance of internal alignment and market responsiveness. Tom Kalinsky's innovative strategies and deep understanding of the American market offered Sega a significant competitive edge. However, the resistance and control exerted by Sega of Japan stifled these initiatives, leading to a fragmented strategy that ultimately hindered Sega's potential to dominate the gaming industry. The legacy of these conflicts underscores the necessity for multinational companies to foster cohesive strategies and just work together, leverage their strengths and insights for all of their global divisions for the good of all stakeholders, namely you and I.